Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, let's uh, go to Father in prayer. Dear Father, we, we thank you so much for letting us come together today to worship you. We thank you for the opportunity to, to worship in song and to study your word. And we pray that we're able to take what we gather in today and sow it out in the world. We pray that our worship today pleases you and, and glorifies your name. And, and we look forward to the time when you bring us back together under one roof. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, join together in song. Okay, well, great. We're getting a chance. This is a little bit different. We've got a bunch of folks six feet apart, and uh, we've got socks on our head, no, so no one can hear us breathe or whatever, but we're going to sing for you, and we would love to have you sing with us because we're getting closer to getting together again. So our first song is going to be How Great Thou Art. <clears throat> oh, Lord, my God. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the suns and I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. Sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! And through the woods and forests glades I wander, and near the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down. From lofty mountain grandeur, and near the brook, and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God.
Good morning. Glad that everybody is uh, able to get up and be about, and especially, Father, where uh, I want you to know that our Father has been protective of those in our congregation that are of higher risk, and I am very happy that uh, that we've been able to to get along without any uh, any really nasty stuff happening to anyone. So as we uh, as we pray, let's keep in mind that God is is the one who really is doing the work here. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for taking care of those that are considered to be high risk, that you wrap your arms around and you keep them. Uh, keep them safe, Father. And Father, we pray that, that for those who are a physical uh, illness, those with cancer, those with, uh, with medical problems that need to be dealt with, Father, we pray that you'll continue to be with them, help them, and Lord, we just pray that, uh, that as, as time and things open up and medical services are, are available, uh, we pray, Father, that you will take care of our people and help them along with uh, the needs that, that are necessary by the hospitals and by the, the healthcare people. And God, we pray that you'll be with this body we know that uh, we know that this is difficult, especially being um, being alone or being with very small groups and and having to uh, having to do what we can to try and sing and praise you and do all of the things that have uh, that are a real blessing that we enjoy here. But Father, we we miss being together, and so please, God, help us to be able to do exactly that to get back together and to worship you together. Father, we pray that you'll be with the leaders of this nation, that you'll be with those making the decisions that are, that are happening. Uh, help them, Father, to be thoughtful about all of the needs of the people. We thank you, Father, for, um, for your body and help us, Lord, to be able to reach out to those around us when the opportunity is there and actually to lift you up and make you uh, the center of all that is good. And Father, when we talk about doing things uh, as a team together uh, to get through the, the tough times, help us to always remember, God, that it is, it is with you that we, we center our attention on you and your will, and we wanna be in harmony with your will. God, we just, we want you to be the one who is uh, directing things. God, we pray now that you'll be with this body. Help us, Father, uh, while, we're, while we're apart, uh, that we can concentrate on your word, that we can be helpful to each other uh, in, in terms of, of your word, studying it, understanding what it is, God, that you want for us. We want your will to be, to be prominent in everything that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy throne crown brow, lead me to Calvary, lest I forget Whoa. 
Good morning, Church of Christ family. I have the opportunity to share a communion message with you this morning as we go to the table. And so I just wanted to share a few scriptures and a few thoughts about what it means to partake in communion, partake of the Lord's Supper, and really the importance of what it means to have a meal together as a family. And as you may know, Jesus is constantly showing the importance of food as a symbol. And in the Last Supper, they partake of the bread, and he says that that's his own flesh. At one point, when the people ask for bread from heaven, the manna, such as the Hebrews had in the desert, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the the bread from heaven. And the idea of feeding people is central to Jesus' message, not just with physical food, but with that spiritual food, because it shows how we need the Lord. We need Him to survive. We need Him for sustenance. And many of us know that. If we have a relationship with God, we know just how much we need His sustenance to live. What I want to share with you this morning is the fact that Jesus calls us to feed others. So not only do we rely on God for our provision and our food, but we're called to feed others. Physically, yes, with real actual food, but also spiritually. And so two verses that I think that really bring us to mind are the verses in John when he's when Peter's apologizing to him and Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And, and Peter's saying, of course I do. And so Jesus says to him, then feed my sheep. That Jesus chooses that as a symbol for love to, to feed his sheep. And he would say that to us as well. Do we love Jesus? Okay, then let's feed the sheep, the, the church of Christ, the, the people of Christ that follow him. And elsewhere 
in a very powerful passage in Matthew, Matthew 25, um, people are asking about the end times. And Jesus will say, well, I was hungry and you gave me food. That's Jesus speaking. I, that Jesus was hungry and we gave him food. And people will say, Lord, when did we do that? When did I ever feed you? And he replies, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Wow. So not only does Jesus feed us, he's our bread, but he says, feed my sheep. And yes, you fed me when you fed my sheep. So I just want to say a prayer for us that as we rely on the Lord and his supper and his spiritual provision for us, that we are also called to feed others through him, um, that we are to be as Christ to others and, and share that divine bread with them. Let's pray. Lord God, um, you are our food, you are our provision, and in strange times such as these, Lord, we, we look to you more than ever, and, and it really is a good thing for us to be called to you, God, and say that um, it's not you know, economic or uh, financial provision that's, that's most important, God. Um, it's you, Lord. As long as we have you, we can make it through any crisis, any hardship. Um, and Lord, you emphasize the importance of us eating our daily bread. And Lord, you call us to feed your sheep, to feed your people, to feed your brothers and sisters. Lord, I ask, could you give us the opportunities, um, the heart, Lord, to really serve our, our brothers and sisters. And Lord, that we can glorify you in this, Lord, and, and really all good things come from you. And in, in sharing with others, Lord, we get to share you. Lord, we thank you and we pray this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. After we take the bread, we often we drink the fruit of the vine, and just as the bread really symbolizes the life of Christ, the fruit of the vine symbolizes the blood of Christ. And the blood of Christ does mean sacrifice, that part of following Christ is the receiving His blood and recognizing what that blood means, the blood of sacrifice. And uh, as I spoke about the importance of us sharing food and sharing uh, that, that bread of life, so also we share that cup of sacrifice, that, that blood. And it's redemptive for us. We, we receive forgiveness through His sacrifice. And I believe that as we partake of that, it is a call for us to remember sacrifice and that we must sacrifice. Jesus says that in order to gain life, we must give up our life. We have to let go of the world in order to enter into relationship with the Father in Heaven through Jesus Christ. So we are called to live a life of sacrifice. And as we share with others, um, we will be sacrificing certain things, our time, money, all of that. And um, most of all, we want to really sacrifice our ego, sacrifice our self, sacrifice our desires of this world so that we can be redeemed in, in our heavenly calling. 
So as we seek to share the bread of life, we're also called to drink of the vine and receive really the, the blood of Christ as a covering and as a call to, to live and to follow through sacrifice as he did. Let's pray. Lord God, uh, we know that Jesus' sacrifice does cover us and his blood redeems us, Lord. And entering into that redemption, Lord, that we too are called to sacrifice and yes, to bear our own cross. So Lord, I pray that as we seek you, Lord, and seek to serve, seek to share, Lord, we can seek sacrifice, not avoid it, but ask, Lord, what is it that we can give up that we may follow you? Um, and Lord, you do ask that we give up the lives of this world, the, the illusions of this world, the temptations of this world, Lord, that we may enter into a full relationship with you. So as we drink this fruit of the vine, Jesus Christ, we ask uh, for your redemptive blood to cover us, that we may just enter into that kingdom of heaven. We do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Finally, um, we use this time just to remind the congregation that we support one another through giving and we do this financially uh, as well as with our time and other resources. Um, it's good to just remind us all that there's a lot of great projects going on at the church including massive renovation and construction and I think we're getting close. Uh, I had a chance to uh, see the building the other day and <laughs> all the carpets are up but it'll be really nice to see all of the renovation there um, so just want to encourage our, our church family to continue to support all that we're doing and if you can do it financially you know we thank you if, if you can do that with your time if you can do that through service we thank you um, whatever ways that you feel the Lord uh, has blessed you to be able to share and give to others uh, please please do so and really this is only a reminder because it's up for everyone in their own heart to be cheer cheerful givers. Um, because we know that God has just blessed us abundantly, if we're to be honest. No matter where we are in life, that uh, we can be thankful for the life that he's given us and the blessings uh, of this life. So let's just pray over the Lord's provisions and um, ask that we he can use our offerings uh, according to his will. Lord God, as, as we donate and contribute and tithe, we ask that, uh, Lord, we can remember that all things belong to you and the resources we have are actually yours, we're just stewards, and that, Lord, in, in, in giving to the church or in giving to others in need, Lord, we're actually just um, using your resources to bless others. Uh, please, Lord, let us know how and, and what we can give that we may do your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I am reading Acts 4, 32-37 in IV. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There was no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses sell them, and bring the money to the apostles to give those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostle nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Mm -hmm. Oh, worship the king. All glorious above and gratefully sing his wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can reside? It breathes in the air. 
mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ at the Boise Church of Christ. My name is Kevin Hooper, and I live up in Midvale. And uh, I'm going to share some thoughts with you today uh, about my family and about the ministry that we have up in our region. Uh, we're able to be here in part because you as a congregation help support our ministry here. Uh, think of us as local missionaries, uh, not the kind that you find on the other side of the world, but uh, just about an hour and a half north of you. We're uh, very thankful to have your support, both financially and uh, prayerfully, uh, that you offer up for us. And I'm able to share this with you today because of uh, the coronavirus and our stay-at-home order. Uh, it's been very difficult for me to get away from the two congregations I work with up in the north uh, because uh, a lot of the work depends on me, so I haven't been able to come down to you on a Sunday but now because we're watching video recorded sermons, I can do this for you and be there with you in this way. So uh, there is a silver lining there, and I'm, I'm thankful to be able to speak to you today. wanted to share with you a little bit about uh, my family. A lot of you know who I am, but some of you may not. Um, I cut my teeth on ministry uh, at the Boise Church of Christ being a youth minister there from uh, 1998 to 2005. And before 98, I volunteered as a part-time youth minister and then um, also did a couple of youth ministry internships there. So in whole, I had done youth ministry at the Boise Church for you know about 10 years or so. And uh, I more recently had been um, an associate minister at the Cross Tower Church of Christ, down in West Jordan, Utah. It was called Southside for a while, but now it's Cross Tower. And then we have been uh, here in Midvale for next month will be almost nine years now. And a lot has uh, changed during that time. A lot of good growth has taken place in our churches and in the community and in my family. Uh, my wife, uh, Elise, and I have seven children our oldest, Corbin, will be 21 next month. Micah is 18. Eliana is 14. Gideon, 11. Evangeline, 7. Everly, 3. And Emmeline is 8 months. So hopefully I got all those right. It's easy to lose track. <laughs> um, recent updates in September, my son Corbin got married. Uh, he married uh, Natalie and uh, he and Natalie live down in Salt Lake City now, and he's doing construction down there. And uh, Micah lives in Meridian. You may see him from time to time. And uh, I'll, I'll show up a picture here a little bit later in the video of everybody. Uh, but that's my family. Uh, our ministry here in this region <clears throat> consists of many different things, as it does in rural areas. You wear a lot of different hats. So I am the the, the preacher, the minister, the youth minister, all the titles uh, at the Midvale Church of Christ, and then uh, also uh, the same for the Weezer Church of Christ, and those two communities are about 20 miles apart from each other, but uh, I do the services in Midvale uh, Sunday mornings, well, when we're having church as we normally have for so many years, uh, Sunday mornings there and then in the afternoons at Weezer. Um, recently, it's just been video recorded stuff. But Sundays are a very busy day usually for us when we're involved in both of those uh, congregations. Uh, besides that, I am also involved in other uh, area-wide things. Um, I'm a board member for Love, Inc. of Washington County. Uh, I know that uh, you all have, as part of your ministry, uh, Love, Inc. Uh, has... Um, at least an office or something there in your building and work out of there too. And there are members that are involved in that. It's a very good 
some very good work. And I love the fact that we are working uh, shoulder to shoulder with members of other churches. It's a wide fellowship. So I'm a board member for Love, Inc. of Washington County. That covers Weezer and Midvale and Cambridge and everybody in between. Um, I've been involved in Camp Ivydale for many, many years. Went there as a camper, uh, as a counselor. Uh, I have directed and I have taught uh, a lot at the camp too. So those are kind of some uh, area-wide ministries. Locally, I'm also doing other things besides what looks like traditional ministry. Um, I'm the parks manager. So I uh, mow the parks here in Midvale every week uh, and take care of trimming the trees and that sort of thing. Um, Tuesdays and Friday nights at, when the summer comes along, I'm also the mosquito abatement guy. I drive the bug truck. And so uh, those are some other things that I'm involved in. And hopefully this summer, I may also be doing some part-time lifeguarding at our community pool. I took that on as a, a great opportunity to get to know kids and young families in our area. So that's a little bit about my work here and my family in this region, uh, as I said earlier, involves wearing a lot of different hats when you're involved in ministry as a whole, but especially in rural ministry. So this quarantine that we've been under has probably caused us to think about church quite a bit differently than we have before. Um, you know, the phrase, hey, it's time to get up and go to church, uh, tells tells us the way we think of church very often. Um, we think about it as a place, or we think about it as um, a time, you know, Sunday morning for a couple of hours, that's church, or the place on the corner of uh, El Dorado and Poplar, that's, a, that's, that's church. That's the way we have traditionally thought about that. Uh, although our language, we are quick to say, no, 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 the church is the people, but we often think about church and practically about a place or a time. But since we haven't been able to meet together in those ways, it has caused us to think about church differently. And I'm, uh, for one, thankful about, uh, for that opportunity. Um, it's made me think about the early church that we read about in the book of Acts a little bit. And so today I'm going to look at three different passages uh, Acts 2, 41 through 47, Acts 4, 32 through 35, and Acts 5, verses 12 through 16. The author of the book of Acts is uh, the physician, Luke, and at times he's a partner with Paul in his missionary work, at times he's not. But um, Luke wrote uh, the Gospel of Luke as well, and this is his second installment of that work. He's uh, he's a historian. He has a great desire to get all the facts straight. He says that to Theophilus, who he writes in the introduction to the Gospel of Luke and also in the book of Acts. He, he wants to say, I have really um, gone to great lengths to interview eyewitnesses to make sure all of these facts are straight so that you can be certain about what I'm sharing with you, Theophilus. And I love that uh, he writes this to Theophilus because the Greek name, uh, or Theos and Phileo, uh, put together means lover of God. And so that's also addressed to all of us who love the Lord. But in these passages I'm going to be looking at here, Luke shares a thing or two about what the early church looks like and what they do, how they do church. And in ways, they're kind of ideal pictures of what the church is. But I think there's some important things for us to look at anytime uh, as a church and to see how we should be living, uh, but also especially during this time where we haven't been able to do church the way we think about church. Uh, it's good for us to look at these summaries of the people of God in the book of Acts and to see what we might glean for how we should carry that mission out now. So let's look at the first one, Acts chapter 2 verses 41 through 47. <clears throat> and this passage that I'm going to read is uh, quick on the heels of a sermon that the Apostle Peter delivers to everyone. 
in the, in the churches of Christ. We know this early passage really well because of our emphasis on believer's baptism, where in uh, 238 you know, or 37, the people are cut to the heart and they say, brothers, what, we should, what should we do about all of this? And Peter tells them, you know, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that's where we have thought a lot about, uh, and, but that's how God forms this community. But you get to verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay, so this is the first uh, summary I'll share with you today that Luke um, takes a hard look at the people of God in the book of Acts and what life was like for them. So first of all, I'd like to show here in verses 41 and 47, we see that this isn't just, it's not just a social club. It's not just a group of people that, well, they share the same affinities for things. They like to do the same things, similar hobbies, stuff like that. That's not who this community is at all. Verses 41 and 47 make it clear this is a God-formed community. Verse 41, those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. God is doing the adding of these 3,000 people buried in Christ into the community of God. 47 says the same thing, uh, praising God, having favor with all the people. The Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. So this is a God-formed community. And we are the church of Christ. We are the people of God. He is the one that does the, the adding. He is the one that that helps us to grow. He forms us. He, he makes our identity. So it's good for us to remember that, that when we are um, thinking church is not going the way we think it should, we should remember here, this is Christ's church. This is a God-formed community. Uh, and that sometimes uh, he does things that, that, that we don't uh, necessarily like or appreciate, but it is his community. So we should be praying for his will to be done in our church family. I love verses 42 and 43 because <clears throat> we see the people of God uh, as a people characterized by awe and worship. So that word awe or awesome gets thrown around a lot. <laughs> I think sometimes we have made that word so common that it's kind of lost its meaning. Um, we might say, man, uh, that basketball game was awesome. Or, oh man, this Dr. Pepper is so awesome. Uh, we just kind of make it so common. It's lost, uh, what it really means. Here we look at verse 43. It says, awe came upon every soul. Okay. That the people were looking to God and his awesome power. That he was the one that created all things, that he's the one sustains all things. He's the one that redeems all things through the giving of his son, Jesus. Uh, these people were remade, renewed, redeemed. And so they were full of awe for who God was. And that caused them to worship him. They were getting together. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, uh, which we still do as we read the New Testament. Uh, they were devoting themselves to fellowship together. They were devoting themselves to the breaking of bread and prayers. Um, and most likely what we're talking about here is they were getting together. They were taking the Lord's Supper. They were praying together. They were studying the word. They were enjoying fellowship. So 
These people were in awe of who God was, and they were worshiping him together as a people. So that looks a little bit different since we haven't been meeting together. Can people still uh, be full of awe? Can people still worship uh, when they're not getting to fellowship together? Well, it does take a little bit of work. Uh, hopefully you have been in your homes still singing to the Lord, still devoting yourselves to uh, the, the Word of God, still sharing the Lord's Supper in your homes, uh, still in awe of who God is, even though you haven't been able to be together with his people. We've had to find our fellowship in different ways. So we have looked to social media and uh, text messages and maybe seeing each other from at least six feet away. Uh, those kinds of things, we're still finding fellowship. But uh, this the passage of scripture we're looking at sees a group of people that are full of awe because they're focusing on God and what he's done. And it results in worship. And as I remember, my uh, college choir director and an elder at the Boise Church of Christ, Dick Dalzell, used to say, uh, he said that worship, uh, worship comes from an old English word, worthship. So when we worship Lord, we're saying that he is worthy. We're proclaiming his worth in our lives. And if your worship is not heartfelt, if it's hollow, if you don't enjoy the song, uh, it could be that you're not really looking at God in awe, but maybe you're looking at yourself. So this group of people, the early church, was in awe of who God was, and they worshiped him. Verses 44 and 45 show us a group of people that there were no needy people among them. They shared their things with each other. They believed that uh, they were together and they held all things in common. Uh, they sold some possessions and then they gave those, uh, the money that they received from, they distributed to others that had need. Um, so what we're seeing here is not it's not some kind of uh, socialistic experiment here where people didn't have any um, personal possessions, but they were just looking at the people and, and their needs above their own. And so if they saw somebody who was in great need, then they would sell some things and they would take care of it, or they would share their possessions with other people. And maybe you've experienced that. I know I have in my life. Um, I can think about the time when our uh, family suburban was broken down and I didn't have another vehicle to lean on, um, my good friend and brother at the Weezer Church of Christ, Warren Tell, said, here, why don't you use my truck for a couple of weeks? And so uh, we were very thankful for him sharing that with you. And, and probably every one of you has a story like that. The early church, uh, there were no needy among them because they counted one another's needs above their own. Verses 46 and 47 show us a group of people that are full of joy and they praise God. And they have, because of that, they have a good reputation. Okay, so day by day, they were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. They praised God and had favor of all the people. So here's a group of people that no matter what's going on, whether it's good times or bad, uh, they counted it all joy. Uh, they were um, praising God for who he is and who, uh, what he has done for them. So they were praising him. And the people outside of this community of believers looked in and said, wow, even though things aren't perfect for these people, even though that guy lost his job, or even though this guy uh, lost his wife uh, to some illness, or even though their children are struggling and rebelling against them, or on and on, you can insert various life situations. Um, they looked at them and saw these people still are full of joy and praising their God. And so the end result was that they had favor with all the people. Uh, I think that's an important thing for us to think about here is that uh, the God-formed community, uh, full of joy, full of praise for God, 
that's a good thing for the community itself, but outside of that community, it's an attractive thing too. And people want to be a part of that. So this is a snapshot of uh, who the early church is. And it's interesting because we look at verse 46 and see them attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. Well, we haven't been able to do that. Life has been different for us since we've been in our homes or at our places of work, but we haven't been able to meet together as a church. Uh, we've had to be creative and find other ways still to find that fellowship. And I know we have up in Midvale and in Weezer, and I trust that you have as well. Uh, we can still have joy and still praise the Lord, even though we're not able to meet together in the four walls of the, the church building. Let's look at the next passage, Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Here's another one of Luke's summaries of the early church, 32 through 35 of Acts 4. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Okay, so we get uh, another summary here of the early church. And we see some more characteristics that stand out. Um, first of all, this is a group of people in 32 that tell us the, this is a unified group. This is one body of people. Okay, They were of one heart and one soul. That is a beautiful thing. One of my favorite passages of scripture is Psalm uh, 133. Where it says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. That's what it is when a people are dedicated to a selfless Lord and not thinking about themselves. When they put the needs of others ahead of them, that promotes unity. And we see that here in this group of people, unity. Uh, we see um, the outflow of that unity is, again, in verses 34 and 35, that there's no needy among them. Uh, they're so unified, they're caring for one another naturally, organically, uh, and easily. And all of this uh, is because of uh, they see the grace of God working amongst them. That's the latter part of verse 33. Great grace was upon them all. And so that's a great reminder for us that when we are a unified body, when we are looking to the needs of each other ahead of our own, um, this is just God's grace upon us all, and we feel that overflowing to one another. God is a God that gives uh, his grace lavishly. It pours out upon us and overflows on us, and when we are dedicated to him when we're, as his people, that overflows to one another as well, and it's a great joy to be a part of it. Let's look at one more, Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, uh, one more of Luke's summaries here of the early church, 5, 12 through 16. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Okay, that's Acts 5, 12 through 16. Again, we see another um, indication that this people, they were a unified group uh, in verse 12. They were all together. Okay, in Solomon's portico. Maybe we haven't been able to be together bodily like this, but we are still together in spirit but through social media, through various ways that we can. Uh, this is a unified group. Verse 13 shows us that uh, this community of believers, this family of God, had a good reputation 
none of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. So we're talking about outsiders here looking in. They hold this body of Christ, the church, in high esteem. They look at it and they're attracted to it. There's a group of people that is unified, a group of people that's full of joy. There's a group of people that care for one another. And so they hold them in high esteem. This is one of the things that might be surprising to us as being a part of uh, the family of God. Uh, when we are doing it well, it's an attractive thing to outsiders. When they look at us and see us living that out well, it's attractive. They have a good reputation. Verse 14, this, this good reputation means that uh, the community grows. Okay, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. They're being attracted to this group of people, and God is adding to their group. And then verses 15 and 16, kind of a strange thing. Um, we don't see this much. <laughs> um, people from outside of this community are bringing the sick there, and the people are being healed. Now, I have yet to see an actual healing in... Um, you know, one of our assemblies, but I have seen lives mended. I have seen evil put away. I have seen people filled with good. I have seen broken families healed. I have seen marriages healed. I've seen people who were fraught with depression healed. Uh, so, this is one of the outpourings, one of the missions of the church, is that as we're together unified, as we're worshiping the Lord full of awe, as we're full of joy, as we're caring for one another, this results in healing in the community. And so that can still happen. Um, the church, wherever you are meeting, regardless of the building or your home, uh, you as a people can attract people to Christ and people's lives can be healed. So let me finish uh, with just a few practical thoughts here. Uh, Tim Keller wrote, uh, everyone says they want community and deep friendship. However, because it takes accountability and commitment, we run the other way. So it's easy for us to look at these summaries of the early church in the book of Acts and go, wow, that's beautiful. That's, that's who we should be. And that's true, but it takes work. It takes sacrifice. It takes compromise at times where not maybe on, we should never compromise on the gospel or the core teachings of who Jesus is, but compromise on our personal desires, the things that we want, the things that we like. We need to compromise there for the good of the body, okay, because it's Christ's church. It's his people, not mine. It takes work. Uh, it takes accountability. It takes commitment for us to be this way. We need to remember that. So something to encourage us here is that we need to be recognizing that God is at work in our people. Sometimes we can get overwhelmed thinking, what kind of, we need to come up with some kind of new program or some new class or some new thing that we can do that will bring in more people. No. Chapter 2, verses 41 and 47 remind us, God is the one at work. God is the one that adds to this community. So what should you do? You should pray that God will add to the family, that God would add to his body. It's his work. And so we pray for his will to be done. That takes a lot of pressure off of us, and uh, that puts it back on him, who is the one that redeems and adds to his family. Uh, we should be a people that assemble for worship as we can. And as I said, we haven't been able to do that for several weeks now. Uh, but we see that's an important thing for the people of God. You can be doing that in your homes as well. I did see a meme that stood out in my mind, and it showed uh, Satan on one side and God on the other looking over the world. 
And Satan said, hey, with the coronavirus, I shut down all of your churches. And God, on the other hand, said, uh, to the contrary, I opened a church in every home. Whatever your perspective may be here, that's a good one to add to it here, that we can still be worshiping the Lord with awe and full of praise and joy, whether we're together in the church building or whether we're in our homes, um, whether we're connected uh, face to face, body to body, uh, sitting in a pew, or whether we're doing it through social media, YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and so on. We need to be a people that worship together. Um, when the time comes, I look forward to fellowship in homes again. Okay, that's one of the things we see here in the early churches. It's not just about going to church. It's not just about assembling at the temple. Uh, the people did that, but they also shared meals with one another in their homes. We need to be people that are doing that. Can you remember a time when it was common that every day after worship, you would come back home and you'd open the door to your home and the, the smell of pot roast hits you in the face. That was a Sunday smell for me growing up because I knew every day after worship, we were having somebody over for a meal. I think we as a culture and as a church have lost that and we need to regain that. Uh, so when the quarantine is over with and when we go back to whatever the new normal is, uh, it needs to include us having people in our homes, sharing a meal. We, sure, we can meet them at restaurants and we can eat there. Uh, but there's something very special and intimate about having someone into your home. Um, the early church did it. We need to be doing that too. We need to be reminded here that we take care of each other. Um, you can see here that n none of the early church here thought that their stuff was their own. They counted the needs of each other above their own. We need to be doing that still. Um, and the only way you can really take care of each other's needs is if you're involved in one another's lives. Uh, I can't anticipate your needs if I'm not in touch with you. We need to be doing that. We need to be enjoying God and enjoying one another. We can see that very plainly in 2, 46 and 47, and chapter 4, verse 32, that the people of God are people that are characterized by joy and praise and awe and worship. We should enjoy one another. Let's do that more. And this is an attractive thing. As I said earlier, um, evangelism can come from this. It's an unsuspected thing that we do. When we do church well, when we're when we're praising God and we're holding the needs of each other above our own, this is attractive to the outside community and they'd like to be a part of that. Uh, and that just leads right along with recognizing God's hand is at work here and he can add to our midst when we're just being his people. And all of this results in healing our community as well. We need to be considering the needs of our neighbors around us. How can we serve them? How can we pray for them? How can we reach out to them? Be the church. Let God work through you. And the community begins to want to come and be a part of that. And they're healed. These are some things I wanted to share with you today. Uh, because I think it's important for us to uh, grapple with who we are as a church. And the way we do things. Um, seeing these passages of scripture in Acts may help us uh, reconnect with some of those characteristics we as the people of God should have. And um, that's an, been an important thing for us in Midville and in Weezer, trying to follow some of these characteristics. We don't do it perfectly, but we're working at it. And I just have to tell you that uh, the church in Midville and the church in Weezer, your brothers and sisters in these areas, um, we're growing. We're growing in number. We're growing in spirit. And uh, a big part of it is because of your support of my family and our ministry here. And we're so thankful for it. I look forward to the day when uh, we can see you face to face and give each other a, a handshake or a hug. Uh, but for now, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you through video. Uh, I hope and pray that you are encouraged today by the word of God. And so... Uh, I'm going to close this off now, and I'd just like to show you a picture of my family. 
uh, the one, the family that you are supporting in ministry. And then I'll close this in prayer. All right, pray with me, please. God, Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters at the Boise Church of Christ. I thank you for their willingness to partner with my family, um, with the ministry that you do through us up in Midvale and Weezer in Washington County. I'm thankful for their prayerful support. I'm thankful for their financial support. And I pray now, Father, that you would encourage them where they are, that uh, very soon um, the effects of coronavirus would come to an end, that uh, your people, your communities would be a healing force in this time, that uh, we would be able to gather back together uh, bodily as a people. But in the meantime, Father, I just pray that you would uh, help your church still to feel unified, even though they're not able to be together. Encourage each brother and sister today in their homes or wherever it is that they see this. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us to glean from your word today, that as we see your God-formed community in the book of Acts, that you will help us to emulate some of these characteristics, uh, that we will recognize you are at work in our church family, and that you uh, desire for us to be unified, full of joy, and that we would share with one another, we would care for one another, and that this would be an attractive thing to the community around us. So uh, we pray today, Father, that your word would be a seed planted deep in our hearts, and that it would grow to fruition and bring about a great harvest. Um, so today, Father, to you, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power, your power at work within us, to you, God, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, the power in the blood. Would you or equal a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. In the blood of the Lamb, of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood, come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. In the blood of the Lamb, of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood. Power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in this life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There's power, power, wonder working power in the blood. In the blood of the Lamb, of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood. Service for Jesus, your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. In the blood of the Lamb, of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power. Blood of 
Thank you, Kevin, for your sermon this morning. We're looking forward to the time when we all can meet together again. Please check your email for an update. We were planning for May 24th. As we assess the situation and plan for the social distancing protocols. Let's have a closing prayer now. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your love for mankind. We thank you for Jesus. And we ask that you help us to be lights in this world for you, that we can show love in these difficult times, and that we can share the good news with those around us. Father, we pray for those that are being affected by the virus, both in health and in the job situations. We pray for a cure, and we pray that we can soon get back to a normal state. Father, we also want to pray for those that are affected with other health issues. We specifically pray for Kathy, and we ask for healing for her. Thank you for this morning, and thank you that we can still have the opportunity to be together through virtual means. Father, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Have a good afternoon.